Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 55. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The word of God for a people of God. Thanks be to God. Theologian named Feli Mati Kerkanen writes, In God's saving work, there is a mysterious interplay of divine and human, of ordinary and extraordinary, or regular and miraculous. This is true, I think, throughout the whole of the biblical testament, and it's remained true throughout history, but it's especially evident in our text today. Ordinary lives are, are suddenly disrupted, and they become extraordinary as God goes about God's work of salvation setting the world right. Our story begins with Mary going to visit her cousin Elizabeth in the Judean countryside. And this, this visit, this journey, follows a visit that Mary had from an angel, the moment of disruption in her otherwise ordinary life. So during this angelic conversation, she learns that she will become pregnant with none other than the Son of God. And she learns that Elizabeth who is an aged woman beyond the age of conceiving, is also pregnant because nothing will be impossible with God. So it's on the heels of this visit from the angel she sets out with haste to see Elizabeth. This journey and visit is, for Mary, an act of faith. On one hand, she is likely seeking confirmation that all the angel told her is true. doesn't make it any less an act of faith what she's doing as faith is never free of questioning or exploration. And questioning and ex exploration can only serve to deepen our faith and understanding of truth. And also, after all, if you had a vision in which you were told such things as an angel told her, first, wouldn't you want to be sure that you weren't off your rocker a little bit? And secondly, yeah, wouldn't you want to know that it was real and know exactly what you were getting yourself into? I think I would, and I think Mary did. And so she goes to see Elizabeth. And if Elizabeth is indeed pregnant, it would validate for her what she has been told by the angel. And on the other hand, I wonder if she also went to Elizabeth just simply to celebrate the miracle of Elizabeth's own pregnancy to celebrate with her and be present with her. She went to Elizabeth not just to receive something for herself, but maybe part of her motivation is to give something as well, to give her presence, her love, her support, and validation for Elizabeth's experience. So She arrives at Elizabeth's home, and before she even has a chance to offer anything, she receives confirmation by the Spirit of God moving through Elizabeth. Merely upon hearing a greeting from Mary, 
the baby in Elizabeth's womb, this baby being John the Baptist, leaped with joy. And Elizabeth says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Blessed is she who believed. Mary took action based on her faith, on her belief. And immediately upon arrival, she finds her faith was not misplaced. She does find a pregnant Elizabeth. And Elizabeth offers the validation by the Spirit that Mary is indeed the mother of the Lord and that she was right to act on her belief and go to Elizabeth. So here we are with two ordinary women in an ordinary place, both going through the rather common ordinary experience of pregnancy, and yet there's nothing ordinary about what is going on. And it's really only through their being together in their shared condition, that these two women can fully understand the scope of what is happening. It's through being together they find that their experience and belief are validated. They come to understand themselves more deeply. They come to see how they, in their individual experiences and roles, fit in the bigger picture of God's saving work in the world. They come to see how their smaller story fit in the larger story of God's activity. So this interaction between these two women then seems to point us to, well, to what's possible in this place, in this community, in the relationships we form and maintain here. Our faith, our belief draws us together, and we're free to question and explore God and God's ways together as we seek out truth. We're here for each other, to support one another, whatever life may bring, good or bad. And in our explorations of faith, we support one another. We're able to give of ourselves, and we're able to receive the gifts of others. And in this sharing, be transformed. And in the course of the exploration and participation in community, we come to understand ourselves, our hearts, and our beliefs more deeply. We come to recognize the gifts that we possess as individuals, and we come to see how those gifts fit with the gifts of others and fit in such a way that we're able to work together, to move as one body, to participate in God's bigger vision of salvation for the world. We become people transformed to participate in transforming others and the life of creation. Mary and Elizabeth met together as individuals, and they both perhaps needed something from their time together. But ultimately, they understood that what was happening and what they were participating in it wasn't really about them. They each possessed unique, miraculous gifts from God to the world, and the gifts they carried and nurtured and loved and sent off into the world were meant to bring life to all people and all of creation. There was nothing individual or isolated about what they were experiencing. Likewise, while we gather in our individuality and with our individual needs, and there is much to be gained by participating in this community as an individual, there's comfort, support, nurture, and love, ultimately we are part of something bigger something that goes beyond our own individual needs, beyond our own individual spirituality and salvation, something that's about the here and now, the flesh, the world, the embodiment of faith that seeks to turn the world right side up, which is the bigger picture of what God is doing. Mary and Elizabeth's experience was very much one of flesh and embodiment. It was physical and of this world, and they, particularly Mary, understood the worldliness of the vision of salvation she was participating in, now as the mother of the Lord, even if she was, and as she was, blessed by it as an individual, which the text also makes quite clear. But upon receiving confirmation that she was indeed the mother of Jesus, 
the Lord. She sang a song that describes the bigger picture of God's saving work in which she was participating and in which we participate. The text represents what God was initiating in the baby that she was carrying and the work that we as the body of Christ now continue. And it's about this world. It's about a transformation of the way our world is structured and ordered. She sings that God has shown strength and scattered the proud, brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted the lowly, and filled the hungry with good things while sending, away, sending the rich away empty. Now this is a rather packed statement. First, it points us to examining the incarnation itself and its location. God has chosen not to come into the world amongst the proud, amongst the powerful, or amongst the rich not amongst those who are at the center of the world. God has chosen to enter the world in the margins. Mary, who carries the incarnation of the divine, is a poor, unwed woman living under the oppression of the Roman Empire in the middle of nowhere. And this is where God chooses to come into creation. This alone reveals a bit about where God's heart is reveals that the world is upside down from how God would have it. In the terms of liberation theologians, it reveals God's preferential option for the poor. God's special love for the poor and the oppressed, which is expressed throughout the whole of Scripture and is embodied now in God taking on flesh in the margins. This preferential option for the poor, it, it doesn't mean that God does not love the powerful, that God does not love the rich, that God does not love all people. But it does beckon the powerful and the rich and those with resources to a conversion toward the poor and the oppressed in such a way that they use their power and wealth and their gifts in the interest of God's vision for the world. A world of peace rooted in justice and equity, so poverty and oppression exist no more, so that the lowly are lifted and the hungry are filled. This then is another dimension of Mary's song. Her baby boy, throughout his life and his ministry, would scatter the proud, would work against the powerful in the interest of the lowly, and would fill the hungry while instructing the rich to be converted and change their ways. He entered a world, a world like ours, as it still is, that was upside down. And he sought to turn it the right side up, the way God intended. And we, again, as the body of Christ, well, such remains our work, the work our faith is all about, the work our faith compels us to, even commands us to. Now, friends, hear me now and hear me clearly. God loves you. God loves you, and you are ever held in that loving embrace of your maker. Nothing will change that. <clears throat> I have no doubt about that, and I hope you have no doubt about that. You should have no doubt about that. God loves you in your individuality. But now how will we express that love that we've received? How will we express that to the world? Because the, God does indeed love the world. And the fact of the matter is how we choose to live out our faith in this world, how we choose to live out that love or not, it has real, embodied, enfleshed, life and death consequences for us, for our neighbors, and for creation. It particularly bears consequences on those of the margins of our world. As paradoxical as it may seem, at the end of our day, our faith isn't really about us. Our participation in a community of faith isn't centrally and totally about us, but it's ultimately about participating 
in God's movement in the world that seeks to turn the world right side up. To participate in the movement of God toward a world of peace rooted in injustice and equity where violence, oppression, poverty, and every hindrance to life and life abundant exists no more. God entered the world through an ordinary woman in an ordinary place. And God continues to enter the world through ordinary people like you and like myself in ordinary places like ours. Not solely for our benefit, but to act for God's life-giving purposes in the world. So let us continue to be a community of love and support for each other. Let us continue to be a community where we can grow in our faith through questioning and exploration together. Let us continue to be a community where we can discover the God-given gifts we each possess and then utilize them together to participate in God's work of turning the world right side up. And let us be open to allowing God to move through us in such ways that the proud will be scattered the lowly will be lifted, and the hungry will be filled. Amen.